I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest news from across Ukraine as Rishi Sunak visits Kyiv in a major pledge of more British support. We also speak about Russian force generation efforts, and Francis Sternley updates us on developments in Ukrainian politics. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Friday, the 12th of January, one year and 322 days since the full-scale invasion began. Today, I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, and assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. So the last 24 hours have been primarily the main action has been down south. 73 Russian strikes against or across Herzon Oblast in the last 24 hours has killed and wounded civilians. This is according to Alexander Pragudin, the uh, the regional governor who was speaking earlier on today. Separately also today, a senior lieutenant of Russia's tank brigade who shot and killed two civilians near Kiev or the Kiev Oblast village of Mariah in 2022 was sentenced to life imprisonment in absentia today. This comes from Ukraine's prosecutor general's office. According to the investigation from the off- from that office, five Russian soldiers, you may remember this, there was footage at the time, five Rus- Russian soldiers in a car with the letter V, which is one of their one of their war symbols. Z is most commonly known, but V is also another one. That was painted on the side, as well as the inscription, Tank Special Forces Rus. They arrived at a commercial premises near the town, which is 10 k's west of Kiev in March 2022. Two unarmed male civilians, that was the owner and a guard of the this commercial premises, approached the soldiers who at first let them let them go, and then as the men were walking away, they were shot. After the killing, Russian soldiers reportedly broke into the, the, the premises and looted the place. The whole thing was caught on the company's video surveillance camera, so you may remember it from the time. Anyway, that trial has, has as I say, sentence one in absentia today. Now, separately, an interesting interesting comment from ISW, Institute for the Study of War. They're looking at the um, the rotation of Russian forces. Of course, you can't you can't keep people forward all the time and expect them to always be operate with peak peak efficiency. So, rotating units out of the line is or should be a standard military procedure. It should be done routinely. It should be well planned for. Not seen that massively. Well, not seen it much at all from the Russian military. However, ISW is saying that they are able to rotate to keep the pace. They're rotating forces such that they're able to maintain the pace of their local offences, offensives across the east of the country in the short term. So a few caveats there, but they are able to rotate some people through. They're citing Ukraine's military intelligence deputy chief, Major General Vadim Skibitsky, a chap I met when we, uh, when we were in Kiev. He was speaking yesterday. He said Russian forces have 462,000 personnel in Ukraine. And he said that represents the entire land component of the Russian military. He said that most Russian units in Ukraine are manned at between 92 and 95 percent of their intended strength. And the size of the Russian grouping in Ukraine is allowing Russia to conduct local rotations throughout the country. He said that Russian forces withdraw units that are at or below 50% of their uh, combat. Well, he didn't use the term combat effectiveness, CE, as we would in the the British military, but it it amounts to the same thing. They go back to to the rear, recuperate, replenish, and then come forward again. Now, Dmitry Medvedev, he's been um, in a a rare moment of lucidity, actually. He's um, so he's he's the uh, Russia's Security Council deputy chairperson, usually can't get through a sentence without threatening nuclear war but he managed it this time uh, and he said that the russian military has successfully replenished russian forces through ukraine using crypto mobilization apparently this relies heavily on volunteer recruitment good luck with that and the coercive mobilization of convicts and migrants he said mevedet said that had generated over 500,000 new personnel in 2023 so quantity but have a think about the quality 
So that will allow Russia, this is ISW's assessment again, that allows Russia to maintain their overall tempo of local offensive operations in the east. But, and it's a big, it's a big but, will they be able to conduct more and bigger rotations in the longer term if they try to do a big push, if Russia tried to do a big push somewhere or if there was a, a, a significant counteroffensive from Ukraine. So lots of questions about the, the capability of the forces, but they're able to kind of maintain what they've got. But we've seen this. I mean, they are conducting very infantry heavy assaults across U- Ukraine. The, the groupings they're using don't require huge amounts of equipment or, or training. We've, we've talked about these meat assault units before. They are replenishing units with very poorly trained, you know, combat inexperienced personnel, but they are deemed sufficient by the Russian chain of command. So, yes, they're rotating people through. Yes, they can maintain the small tempo, which is which is producing local, as in very short term and not great distance results, but nothing particularly significant. Now then, separately, I mean, it is, so their assessment at the moment is that that Russia has the initiative through East Ukraine at the moment in East, but not in the South. They say that in the South, around Herzon, they are still, Russian units are actually going backwards they are their units down south are being degraded those units that are operating near in the vicinity of the the ukrainian bridgehead over the the east bank the left bank of the of the dnipro river the ukraine is said to be inflicting significant losses on russian forces trying to dislodge that that ukrainian force there there are indications that this is partly down to the repeated and persistent russian command and control problems creating a huge number of casualties Russian, well, in fact, multiple Russian military bloggers are saying that air defence units and others, but they single out air defence units, are having to wait for permission from superiors to fire on Ukrainian drones, helicopters, all the rest of it, which obviously, you know, you've missed the opportunity then. Basically, it's gone and it's done whatever it was it was going to attack. So the ISW say Russian commanders also repeatedly take several hours to approve artillery strikes and require units to send target coordinates and video or photo confirmation of targets before approving the strikes. Um, now, all of this indicates, in my, in my view, the continued sort of constipation, really, of this very top-down, rigid, turgid Russian chain of command. You know, if people at lower levels are not able to use their initiative and or it indicates a severe well a severe reaction to shell and mortar missile and mortar shortages so if they're having to really if they haven't put permission to fire up all the way up the chain i mean it's, it probably speaks of them trying to conserve ammunition that is sort of or linked to i suppose by today's British Ministry of Defence Intelligence update citing a Russian mill blog community that says Ukrainian FPV drones, so the first person view drones, the ones that actually they fly and they are they are steered into the target by the I don't know what do we call them? Pilots, drivers, the person with the goggles on back down the line. They are said to have destroyed 90%. This is according to Russian mill bloggers, so big dose of salt, but destroyed 90% of Russian equipment in the vicinity of Korean Key that's um, you know over on the on the left bank of the Dnipro that is a staggering amount of equipment seems hard to believe just because it's so high so and always I would suggest treating it with caution but clearly Russia is not having any kind of success there they should have pushed that Ukrainian force back into the river you know, it's not great ground for, for Ukraine to hold and, and operate on and try and try and expand out of now they've not expanded and they've not pushed very far into into the region there but equally it shouldn't have been an, an overly complicated military task for russia to shove them back into the water and they've not done it they've been there since november and don't look like they're budging anytime soon british mod just to finish off with they're saying that one of the russia's one of the reasons for russia's inability to counter this first person view drone um, threat is because Russia is lacking electronic warfare assets, the kind of things that can jam the signal, make the drones fall out of the sky, or make them miss where they're intending to go, or or just just mess up the whole electromagnetic spectrum in that area. Those kind of things, electronic warfare, prime targets. So if they are ever spotted, you'll find FPV drones going after them, artillery would be fired at them, etc., etc. They are key assets on the battlefield that would be targeted first if seen. So perhaps Ukraine is having a 
a um, significant impact against the EW, which is then allowing those FPV drones to move on to other targets. And that in itself, as in Russian tanks and all the rest of it, trying to push Ukraine back into the river. And so perhaps it's all degrading the ability for what Russian units are there to act in a coordinated manner and try and try and get their get their stuff in one sock, so to speak. And that's it, David. I take a pause there. Well, thank you very much, Dom. It's good to have you back. Francis, you've been looking at a number of different stories. Do you want to draw them all together for us? Well, thanks, David. It's good to be back. Yet another international crisis is drawing the headlines today, namely attacks by American and British forces on 60 targets in Yemen after the Iran-backed Houthi or Islamist organisation carried out missile and drone attacks on shipping in the Red Sea in response to the Gaza war. Now, they vowed to retaliate, but it's too early to say whether this will grow into a broader crisis or whether these actions will have had the deterrent effect that they are clearly intended. We have commented many times on the connections between Iran, Russia and their hostile proxies. So that will be something for us to consider further in the coming days. Evidently, the West is already facing several threats at once with potentially significant implications for support for Kyiv. Now, on that theme, some reassurance for Ukraine today, though, as the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is on a surprise visit to Ukraine to meet with President Zelensky after unveiling a 2.5 billion military aid package uh, for Kyiv. Within the past hour, he stepped off the train and made some remarks, which Moscow has already responded to. And I'll get to that in a moment. But first of all, what are the pledges? Well, he said that it will st- we will stand with Ukraine in its darkest hour, providing that those billions across 2024-25. That includes an increase of £200 million from the previous two years. We'll be supplying drones, long range missiles, air defences and artillery shells. And he said the following. For two years, Ukraine has fought with great courage to repel a brutal Russian invasion. They are still fighting, unfaltering in their determination to defend their country and defend the principles of freedom and democracy. I am here today with one message. The UK will not falter. We will stand with Ukraine in their darkest hours and in the better times to come. Now, interestingly, he will sign a security agreement as well today, guaranteeing that Britain will provide swift and sustained support from Britain if Russia attempts another invasion. It will also set out the intelligence sharing, cybersecurity, medical and military training that the UK will provide for Ukraine, along with cooperation with British defence industries. This agreement is apparently the result of last year's NATO summit in Vilnius and the first step in developing an unshakable, their words, 100-year partnership between Ukraine and the United Kingdom. So we have their two explicit long-term commitments, evidently designed to show that Ukraine's future trajectory as a Western nation is assured as a result of the invasion. But we'll need to read the small print, as always, as to the exact nature of that military cooperation in particular. Evidently, it is not a commitment to go to war if there were another a future invasion, rather to provide military support. That will not be enough in terms of long term security commitments for Kyiv, which will evidently, as we've discussed many times, need a watertight guarantee from several Western nations to act as a robust enough defence from further invasion. Many say that NATO membership is the only thing that can provide that. But one wonders whether that is absolutely true if similar security guarantees to those in NATO were in place designed by and signed by several important Western military powers, but not necessarily all of them, which I think will take a long time indeed. And it's a question as to whether Ukraine has that time if this war ends. Now, in terms of the short term commitments that Sunak is offering, it's noteworthy following Zeluzhny's essay that 200 million of that aid package is, as I say, being spent on providing thousands of drones. Indeed, the British government is saying that it's the largest delivery of drones to Ukraine from any nation. So to quote directly, the technology will give Ukraine cutting edge battle tested capability to defend their citizens and target the invading Russian forces on land and sea. It says the now listeners will recall that uh, uh, Zeluzhny spoke of the need for innovative weaponry in order to restore the advantage on the battlefield. And I think this 
would feed into that. So, so suffice to say, it will go nowhere near far enough to be decisive, which really will require the backing of Washington. But again, we've talked about that a lot. One wonders whether this is part of a coordinated strategy by Ukrainian allies at this moment to make long-term commitments to Kyiv. Zelensky's Baltic tour is continuing with Estonia also making pledges alongside Lithuania. And more on all of that once we have collated all of the pledges. Now, I promised to give the very, very latest, which is in just in the last few minutes. Sunak has made some more remarks about the importance of supporting Kyiv at this moment. He says, we are one of Ukraine's most significant supporters when, come, when providing military aid. The aid that we've got in place already runs through the early part of this year. So we're acting in advance of that expiring with a new commitment of this two and a half billion pounds more than provided in previous years. A very robust response from the Kremlin saying that Britain is our eternal enemy and saying how would the West, the Western public react to the fact that the British delegation came under fire from cluster munitions in the centre of Kyiv as happened to the civilians of our Belgorod. And one more thing, I hope that our eternal enemies, the arrogant British, understand that the deployment of their official military contingent in Ukraine will mean a declaration of war on our country. So that, I think, is a reference to the conversations around Britain potentially having a military contingent permanently in Ukraine and based in Kyiv. So not surprising response, always strong words from Moscow, but nonetheless, I think important to get in there. And just turning to other developments, specifically in Ukrainian politics. We know Kyiv is suffering significant issues with recruitment and Zelensky has indeed demanded that Ukrainians living abroad return to fight against Russia or pay taxes to assist the war effort. So he told a press conference in Tallinn, Estonia, that between six to eight taxpayers are needed to fund every Ukrainian soldier. So to quote him, if you're working and paying taxes, then you're also defending the state and we really need this. But if you're of military age and you are abroad and you're not on the front line and you don't need to pay taxes and you've left the country against the law, then there are questions. That's it. If we want to preserve Ukraine, if we want to preserve Europe, then we must all understand. We either help Ukraine or not. We are either the citizens who are in the front or the citizens who must work and pay taxes. There will be no funds for the military. And if there is no money to fund the soldiers, then there will be no soldiers. Then there will be no one to defend Ukraine. Such are the rules of life. Now, again, we're going to need to look at the details of this and what it will exactly mean for Ukrainians living abroad. But evidently, there will be some implications. It comes off the back of Ukraine's parliament rejecting a controversial government bill aimed to draft more soldiers into the armed forces. That bill would have seen penalties for draft dodging increased, the call-up age lowered from 27 to 25, and compulsory service cuts from an unlimited period of time to 36 months. But Zelensky's Servant of the People Party has now said that some provisions we acknowledge violate human rights. Some are not optimally optimally formulated. We understand the request of the military command and are ready to meet it. But not all the rules can be supported. So the government is expected to rework that bill before reintroducing it to the parliament and for it to be legally upstanding, given as well, of course, the new challenges it faces from in conforming to rules in the European Union, of which, of course, it is now trying to join. Although, again, that's going to be a very long term prospect. But just mentioning the EU, David, lastly, we're hearing that the EU may well be preparing to bow to some of Viktor Orban's demands to secure that 50 billion support package for Ukraine. The Hungarian prime minister vetoed that aid package back in November. Listeners will recall, very significant at the time. And in a bid to get him to drop that opposition, the European Commission is apparently open to giving Mr Orban an opportunity to stop that four-year deal in 2025. So basically trying to get this one in place by offering him the opportunity to delay things further down the line. But that's coming from the Financial Times. We'll be looking more into that. I'm sure Joe Barnes does also have some thoughts on that when he's next on. Absolutely. And thank you again to Joe for all of his work this week while Francis and Dom uh, were off. I recognise, of course, you guys have been off. So there's a limit to how many updates and stories we can do today. So let's go to our final thoughts then. Francis or Dom, would you like to go first? Why don't you go first, Francis, Stanley? Thanks, David. Well, Dom and I can now reveal where we were the last three days. We were at a hostile environment training course where your forced to undergo all sorts of uh, grim things that you may 
encounter if you're in combat or other hostile areas. It's all sorts of things, not just war zones. And as part of that, we were taken to a mock minefield. And it was the first time that I saw in person the parrot or butterfly mines deployed from mortars and aircraft by the Russians. And what was so striking about them is that they fit in the palm of your hand and cost under 10 euros to produce, which, of course, we knew, but it's quite a different experience when you're actually holding one in your hand and they're extremely difficult to spot you're actually it's one of the exercises and incredibly easy to set off and just imagining the prospect of entire fields littered with mines like that or similar which are capable of taking your foot off really like it's nothing just spoke to the challenge faced by mine disposal units prior to the Ukrainian counteroffensive, and indeed all of those soldiers who fought in that counteroffensive after the Russians had bunkered in and prepared for those assaults. We knew that, of course, but it was striking seeing it in person, especially when the instructor shows what you have to do when you're trapped in a minefield, and there really is no easy way out, and you're effectively forced to prod in front of you, brush away any foliage and you're inching forward the idea of crossing an entire field that way it would take you hours and hours and as I say it just was something that was reiterated to me the devastating cost of minefields and indeed the amount of time that it will take for them to be removed once this war ends of course we're still finding mines and munitions from the first world war every year and the thought of how many have been laying in the past two years it doesn't bear thinking about we also as part of the uh, training i won't go into too many details got kidnapped and dom was actually asked to shoot me by our captors and i'm happy to say he declined the opportunity although there were there were a few uh, moments of pause i think but i'll let i'll let i'll let him uh, talk a little bit more about the uh, the training Gosh, Francis, that must have been a heavy couple of minutes stretching out as Dom really thought deeply about that. But I'm I'm very glad it went well. Dom Nichols, do you want to add anything? Uh, Yeah, we won't say too much about the about the training because it preserves their their um, security as well as ours and others that have done the course. But no, it was it was a fascinating couple of days. Always worth doing. I've been trying to get on the course for years. I kept saying I didn't need to do it because I was in the army. And I said that's exactly why I need to do it. And it also shows me that you don't understand risk. But anyway, so I was very glad to do that. Medical training is always worth doing, and uh, updating updating on that. But also, you know, things about about just looking at the world through a different lens. It's fascinating where risk can come from, and you are most likely to be kidnapped where from your hotel room. Apparently, yeah. So it was very, very interesting, interesting course. On the mines, it, I mean, that was yeah, always horrific. You stand there and they say, right, bear it in front of you, there's a load of mines. Can you spot them? We go, ooh, is it that leaf? No, it's not that leaf. Is it that? And of course, you've no way of spotting these things. You really, they're almost impossible. I remember when we had James Cowan, former Major General, British Army General James Cowan, who's now the chief exec of Halo Trust, the, uh, the charity, who said that for every day of a high-intensity conventional conflict, every day makes one month worth of demining required, which is why we're still demining in Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, elsewhere, all around the world, Bosnia, so on and so forth. So it just shows just every time you, you think about the war in Ukraine, for every day it's going to be another month of demining. This is going to be, this is going to see how most of our... Uh, careers if if not more so no it was fascinating i've only time i've ever been in a minefield was in bosnia when i had a problem with the engine of my helicopter and i had to do an emergency landing into a minefield because that was the the only thing underneath me i had to stick it in and hope for the best the best happened and then we managed to get out but yeah it does it does focus the imagination when you're when you're sat in these things waiting for rescue so fascinating course and yeah i hope i hope only the periphery of, of the training we, we receive will ever actually have to put into practice but just to finish off the week i know i mean we're now what second week of january in it's all been fairly frantic every time you open your inbox there's another burst of activity which is why we've put off any ideas about our thoughts for the rest of the year but david is it worth now having a just a quick chat about the future of our our cousins uh, over at Battle Lines, the other sort of defence and international security themed podcast here at The Telegraph. What are your thoughts there, David? Well, thank you so much for asking, Tom. So listeners might be aware we started Battle Lines in October. We brought forward the, the release of the new podcast 
uh, after the October attacks on Israel by Hamas. And we focused for the first few months just on that war, that conflict. Uh, the point of the podcast, the idea behind the podcast was to do several things. One is that obviously on Ukraine, the latest, we recognize that we have a certain niche of expertise and journalistic expertise is the right word, really, in terms of defense and security and foreign affairs. So we wanted to basically zoom out slightly and create a podcast where we could look at all of the Telegraph's defense and security journalism under one roof, not just um, on this podcast, obviously, Ukraine, and also not just Israel Gaza. So Battle Lines is back in the new year. We do one episode a week looking at a number of different crises, conflicts, issues around the world with our wonderful foreign team and our wonderful defence team. So this week we talked to Natalia Vasilieva, our Middle East correspondent, who updates us on the latest news in Jerusalem. We talked to Sophia Yan, senior foreign correspondent, who speaks about her work uncovering the Chinese state's repression of its citizens by using ethnic Kazakhs. I spoke also to Tom Sharp and Danielle Sheridan, who spoke about the breaking news we heard last night of British and American strikes on the Houthi rebels from in the Red Sea. And finally, the one of the most interesting interviews I've, I've done this year so far, I'd say, I spoke to an academic and journalist, Matthew Charles, who writes for The Telegraph about South America. He One of his specialities is Ecuador. Ecuador is in a state of emergency. The government has declared a state of internal conflict as the security services battle drug gangs in the streets uh, uh, around the country. Uh, a huge um, moment in South American uh, geopolitics, which has implications on all sorts of things from um, the influence of Britain and the US Argentina, Brazil, and of course the global drugs trade. So Battle Lines will be coming out later today with all of those stories. Do listen to that. You can find it on any podcast app. And of course, you'll hear many of the same voices that you've heard on Ukraine The Latest. Obviously, Natalia Vasilieva used to be our Russia correspondent. Sophia Yan, we often get on to talk about China. So it's lots of the same journalists that you'll be hearing over on Battle Lines as well. But just to re-emphasize and reiterate that the podcast has changed slightly with zooming out from just the Israel-Gaza conflict to look at lots of different things at the same time. And I think in the future we'll be able to bring other friends of this show, Roland Oliphant, Venetia Rainey, when she's back, onto Battle Lines as well. So do listen to that and do please let let us know what you think. We're still tinkering with the format, thinking about how we do it, but we hope it's it's a good and, above all else, an informative listen. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, a world affairs newsletter which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine The Latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Giles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.